So we're going to focus on application related to vision, and I'll start out by talking about a couple disorders where vision may be affected. And some of this is our disorders that we've already talked about in this class, but we didn't focus on visual loss or aspects of vision, aspects of visual loss. And so Alzheimer's disease, we've already talked about. And what are what are some I guess causes or features of Alzheimer's disease? Actually, there's two of them right here: neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid plaques. That rings a bell, right? <laughs> and we also lose acetylcholine, some cholerogenic neurons. Um, remember how much depth we went into that, but those are the three main um, features of autism and it relates to the types of visual loss that we see. So in Alzheimer's disease, we can have low level uh, uh, deficits, so deficits in just basic acuity or contrast sensitivity or color perception, and then we can also have deficits in higher levels of visual processing. Think about those ventral and dorsal streams, the what is it pathway and where is it pathway. We, so we can have deficits in object recognition, spatial localization, and functional skills like reading. And the type of loss is really associated with what makes sense in this class is where the deficit is. And so one of the causes of visual loss in Alzheimer's disease is loss of retinal ganglion cells and optic nerve fibers. So precortical, so before it actually gets back into the brain, we can see a reduction of, of cells in that ganglion layer. And that's because some of the cells within the retina use acetylcholine. So if we're losing acetylcholine neurons within the brain, it makes sense that within the eye itself, those neurons are vulnerable. And so if we lose, <clears throat> if we lose cells in these early layers, we can have low-level visual processing loss. So impaired visual acuity and contrast sensitivity are the two most common features. If we have amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles in our temporal and parietal lobes, it makes sense that those visual, higher level visual pathways can be damaged as well. So that ventral stream was responsible for the what's, right? So if we have damage to the visual stream, we have impaired object recognition, impaired facial recognition, and deficits in color and pattern processing. So remember that ventral stream is the details about the objects. And primarily in Alzheimer's disease, these are, those deficits are due to neurofibrillary tangles, more so than amyloid plaques. The other stream that we talked about was the dorsal stream, and that was the one that had to do with spatial processing or spatial awareness. So if we have damage to the parietal lobe in the dorsal stream, or I say damage, but if we have those neurofibrillary tangles in the dorsal stream, we lose visual spatial processing, visual motor coordination, and motion perception. Okay? So ventral dorsal, you got that? What and where? I live with this voice all day long. I can't handle it. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so that's Alzheimer's disease. So you can see any of these deficits, but the type of deficit depends on either where we're losing cells, so loss of those acetylcholine cells or cholerogenic cells in the actual ganglion, or whether or not we have those fibrillary tangles in the ventral or dorsal streams. More so we see it in the ventral. So that makes sense. If you have people with Alzheimer's disease who don't recognize things, who don't recognize people's faces. We've also talked about multiple sclerosis. Okay, this was an inflammatory autoimmune disease that reduced myelin where? CNS or PNS? CNS. CNS, okay. So, we can also see visual deficits in multiple sclerosis, and actually visual deficits associated with optic neuritis are often one of the very first things, one of the first symptoms that people will have with this disorder. What else do we see in MS? Early symptoms. Numbness and tingling are usually going to be the first unilateral or bilateral? Unilateral. unilateral. Fatigue will come in. That usually comes in a little bit later. So, causes of 
visual problems in MS, again, optic neuritis is one of the first things, first symptoms, it's inflammation of the optic nerve. And a lot of, most of the time you're only gonna get this in one optic nerve, because this usually starts unilaterally. And that causes blurry vision, a graying of the vision, or a temporary blindness in that eye. Why? Because if you lose the optic nerve, you lose all vision coming from that eye. You guys did that today in lab, okay? In MS, you can also get muscle fatigue, and that's muscle fatigue in the whole body, but it's those six extraocular muscles that control the eyes as well, six on each side, so 12 extraocular eye muscles. When the eye muscles become fatigued, they lose coordination, just like your whole body loses coordination as you become fatigued. And when the eyes can't move and coordinate with each other, you have problems like diplopia, double vision. You can also have, and this just says deficit, deficits in binocular vision, but what happens, we learned this last year in development, what happens if the two eyes don't team together? What do we lose? Depth, depth perception. perception. So you can have problems with depth <coughs> perception. So safety can become an issue if people are losing their ability to team their eyes together in order to proceed to depth. And just like we saw in Alzheimer's disease, there can be a loss of the retinal ganglion cells in MS as well. And this would again cause impaired visual acuity and contrast sensitivity. And unlike Alzheimer's that's progressive MS, remember it's gonna come and go. So the inflammation, the problems are gonna come and go. If there is scarring, then some of these deficits may, may not be temporary. They may be permanent but some of them are gonna come and go as the symptoms of the disease, as the inflammation occurs and then um, goes into, um, it's a word I can't come up with, remission, thank you. Somebody mentioned uh, concussions this morning. TBIs are another area where um, we see a high percentage or a high degree of visual problems um, and this in about 75% of patients that have a TBI, even a mild TBI, there is some visual um, processing impairment, again, not always permanent based on the level of the injury. So you know in a head injury, you get the brain usually bouncing from one side of the skull to the other. It's the coup and the contra coup injury. You don't have to know that for this class. You can also get this left to right. So if a baseball hits you in the side of the head this way, your brain's gonna bounce off the left skull and then back on to the right skull. And as the brain is bouncing around, you can imagine how all of those pathway, pathways that we talked about this morning could become damaged, or at least if there is pressure or inflammation in the brain, that they might be temporarily out of commission. And the third and the sixth cranial nerve in particular, the third is what nerve? And the sixth is? Abducens, right. All right, abducens innervates one of our extraocular eye muscles, third cranial nerve innervates four of them. You don't have to memorize which ones. But if you damage or even impinge these nerves temporarily, it's gonna lead to problems with those eyes, again, moving together um, and being able to team for convergence, divergence, and accommodation. So any type of cranial nerve injury can lead to problems with the eyes moving together. Other symptoms associated with the <laughs> eye are blurry vision, light sensitivity, why do you think light sensitivity? What nerve is going to help constrict the pupil and control how much light comes in? Ocular motor, your third, okay? So light sensitivity potentially because you cannot constrict your pupils as needed. <clears throat> difficulty fixating, double vision, visual field loss, and difficulty reading are all symptoms of TBI and again dependent on where the damage is. But these are the most frequent frequent scene. Somebody <coughs> mentioned earlier, if somebody has a head injury or you suspect a head injury, one of the things you do is look at their pupils. You can see in this case, this pupil is much more dilated than this one. It's not necessarily damage to the oculomotor nerve, but it's a reflection of intracranial pressure. And so it suggests that there is some swelling going on in the, in the brain itself. And it would be a 
sign that you need to get that person to the emergency room Pituitary tumors, you guys have seen the pituitary gland in lab. It's a pea-sized endocrine gland that secretes a lot of different hormones. Again, you don't need to know what those are right now. But it protrudes from the base of the hypothalamus on a, a stalk called what? Infundibulum. <laughs> awesome. Okay. And the infundibulum, it's gonna, the pituitary gland itself is going to sit. And I don't, this picture just shows the tumor, but it sits right on top of the optic chi. So if you have a, a tumor on the pituitary gland, one of the things that can happen is that you lose that central part of the optic chiasm. What type of fibers are crossing in that optic chiasm? Your nasal retinal fibers that are giving you information about what visual field? Peripheral visual field. So if you lose the optic chiasm at that central point where the fibers are crossing, you are going to lose your peripheral vision in both eyes. Whoops. And that is called, it should be on your notes, right? Or is it not on your notes? Oh, it's on the next page. It's called bitemporal hemianopsia. So meaning both temporal parts of the visual field. Flip over. Hemianopia, just meaning vision loss, okay? Non-homonymous means not the same. So the visual deficit is not the same in both eyes. What would be the same is if you lost the right visual field in both eyes, or the left visual field in both eyes. In this case, you're losing the temporal visual field in both eyes, but it's not the same side. So the full name of this loss, if you lose the optic chiasm, is non-homonymous bitemporal hemianopsia. Yeah? So when you lose both nasal retinal fields, why do you also lose both temporal fields? So you lose, <coughs> sorry, you lose your nasal retinal fields, uh -huh. which means you lose your peripheral visual fields. with this one. We can also have visual damage because of stroke. Um, and the main culprit is usually the MCA because it projects to a wide range of areas in the brain. The MCA is going to help to supply the optic tract and the optic radiations. They also have separate supplies. The optic tract by the posterior communicating artery and the anterior choroidal artery and the optic radiations also by the anterior choroidal artery. We are not doing blood supply, so you don't <coughs> need to memorize that, but we will probably link back to it when we do blood supply, and I will remind you that these are, are the, the vessels that are going to supply aspects of vision. But for right now, you can just erase that from your mind, <laughs> and we will talk about other areas of damage. So, optic tract. If you lose the optic tract, and again, you did this already today. In this case, if you lose the right optic tract, the right optic tract is carrying information from your left visual hemifield, right? All of it, all of the information from your left visual hemifield. So, if you lose the optic tract, you have contralateral, meaning the opposite side to the injury, homonymous, meaning the same in both eyes, Hemianopsia. So in the case of this example, we lose the right.
right optic tract, we lose the left visual field with left homonymous hemianosia. Yes, Deborah. Are those drawn from the bottom right there? In lab, we have those, these like questions like this, and like two circles. Are those drawn, do those correspond to the patient? Yes. And I didn't ask you guys to do quadrants yet. These are in quadrants, but basically, you would, if you had a circle, like on your lab diagram, you would have a line down the middle and you'd color in half of it dark, meaning you are losing that part of your vision in both eyes. That part of the visual field in both eyes. Zach. Just to clarify, hemianopsia? You can use either term, hemianopia or hemianopsia. They are interchangeable. Before I click to the next slide, what is this pathway that goes through the temporal lobe called? Myers loop. It carries information from what quadrant? The top, superior, right? And then this more medial one is going to be carrying information from the lower visual quadrant. So, oops. if we lose just this branch of the optic radiations, we are just going to lose the inferior quadrant. All right? If you got this far in lab and you understood that you're losing, if you lose the right optic radiations, that you're losing the left visual hemifield, then it's easy enough to say, okay, these fibers looped around, they're safe, I'm only losing the inferior quadrant. I'm not losing the whole hemifield. If you lose the medial tract, you're gonna have high on the floor, or inferior contralateral homonymous quadrantinopia. Inferior, coming from what quadrant? Contralateral is the same as before because it's the opposite side. Homonymous meaning it's the same in both eyes. And instead of hemianopia, meaning the hemifield, the half of the visual field, you're only losing a quadrant. So it's quadrantinopia. Myers loop, you lose the upper quadrant, the superior visual quadrant of the contralateral visual field. So you end up with high in the sky vision or superior contralateral homonymous quadrant tenopia. The names are big, but if you can figure out what the loss looks like, Superior quadrant, opposite visual field, and it looks the same in both eyes. Can we do any of those again? Thank you. I have a question about the circle. Okay. So in the on our lab diagram, or the lab one, the first question was if what depth it would you get if you optic nerve of the right eye, and we said the right periphery visual field and the left medial visual field. You lose the whole right 
AI if you lose the optic nerve. So everything coming into the right eye, you lose that whole eye. Okay, so but that makes it right periphery of the, like, of the visual field is right periphery coming in and left knee gel. Somebody else asked me this and I thought we should. But I don't know how to draw it. Okay. Of the eye, you're losing. These are your circles. These are what you guys are coloring in. Right. right? So right. if you lose the optic nerve, right. you're losing this, which means you're losing this. You're losing this, which means you're losing this, which means this whole thing gets colored in. They're having difficulty with this part-to-whole relationship, so they're just not seeing the whole object. But they probably can tell you that this stuff isn't a circle or isn't represented a circle. All 
Alternatively, if you damage the anterior, inferior temporal cortex, you get something called associative agnosia. And in this case, they are able to recreate that sensory representation, but their ability to verbally identify the object probably has to do with fibers that are connecting the temporal lobe up to Broca's area and other parts of the frontal lobe. We're not going to get into that right now. But these are two disorders I wanted you to be familiar with because oftentimes if you are going in and testing post-stroke, you will do some assessments like this where you're asking them to identify objects. And it's not necessarily just this, but you'll say, you know, what is this? It's a comb. What is this? this is a comb. Sometimes people can't name the comb, but they can tell you what it's used for. Sometimes they Draw it. So this is one of those things that you can do to tease out where the damage is and what the full um, the, the full scope of the loss is. Another type of um, agnosia is prosopagnosia. How many of you guys have heard of this? Okay, it's an inability to recognize faces, and that is usually caused by damage to the fusiform gyrus, which we looked at in week one. And the fusiform gyrus is sort of part of the inferior temporal gyrus, and it's sort of part of the occipital lobe. It travels back and kind of lives between the two. But specific damage to the fusiform gyrus can result in an inability to recognize faces. And what it really does is it means that the, the faces themselves, the distinct or detailed aspects of the faces, are not being processed. So it's potentially a blurry image, but it's probably more or less a, a God, who's the artist that drew everything really distorted? Um, Picasso, you know, sort of like where pieces are everywhere and it's not real clear and so it's hard to recognize faces because the details of the faces are not coming in clear. So that's prosopagnosia, an inability to recognize faces caused by damage to the fusiform gyrus. Tara? In the fusiform gyrus, and specifically in a specific area of the fusiform gyrus, it is just faces. There is an area of the fusiform gyrus that is just facial processing. We have a whole part of our brain just devoted to that. There are other parts of the fusiform gyrus that are involved in other aspects of object recognition. So it depends where along that gyrus you get the damage or that you have the dysfunction. But there is a special facial recognition area of the brain, and that's in that gyrus. Is this something you're, let's see, Bless you're born you. with, or like you can get from like traumatic brain injury? It would be more from a brain injury or stroke. Okay. That's it for disorders. You guys okay? We'll be talking in Al's class this semester. Let me go back to this. This was a quote out of one of the articles I was reading. Um, it says, a neurovision care and rehabilitation team is comprised of specialists in optometry, ophthalmology, physiatry, neurology, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech therapy. And so it just, you know, as you're doing this and you're thinking, I don't have to figure out where the brain injury is. There's going to be a doctor doing the MRI. That is very likely the case. That part is not your job. But you do need to understand where the functional deficits are and to know what to look for based on that MRI or based on that doctor's note that you're getting. And so OT is really seen as part of the team, and we are one of the people who do vision rehabilitation. It is a specialty area in OT, so there's a baseline level of information that you get in this program. Um, a lot of that will come in your adult rehab classes. But there is advanced training, advanced certification, if that is something that you choose to go into. When you see a client for the first time, um, you're going to look for some key things. You may actually do some reflex testing, like the pupillary light reflex, or maybe some vestibular ocular testing. But one of the things you can do is just look at their posture. You know, if they're slumped over like this, and you're thinking maybe there's weakness or sensory loss on this side of the body, but then you can also be thinking about where are their eyes pointed? You know, where are they looking? If I come into the room from this side, do they even notice that I've entered the room? 
or if there are people, if they have guests, uh, visitors in the room, who are they orienting to? Are they able to orient around the room, or do people have to sit in a certain area for them to be able to see them and to orient to them? You can look at how their eyes are moving together. Are they moving together, or do you have some discoordination between the two eyes? So there's a lot of things you can look for just, just walking into the room and seeing where their visual attention is and how the eyes look, how they're moving together. Formal testing, you can look at eye movements. We did some of this with babies. Are they able to track? Are they able to track across midline? Are they able to track in all planes? Are they attending to all visual fields? And sometimes you can look at visual field loss just by handing them a piece of paper. We already looked at like clock drawing or house drawing, but if you give them a piece of paper that has, you know, from right to left, left to right, like A, B, C, D, and E as options all the way across the page. Look and see, do they scan all of their options? Do they look all the way across or do they get to see and stop? So you're looking at where their eyes are going, where they're paying attention to. And then of course you're going to look at what areas of occupation are impacted by the potential visual loss. Are they able to read now? If not, can you figure out why? Is it because of eye fatigue? Is it because they've lost the ability to track or to scan? Have they lost visual acuity due to their injury? Driving can be an issue, and there are, we actually have somebody coming in, a potential faculty member who runs a driving rehab center. It's one of the huge things that they have to look at if they're gonna return somebody to driving is, are they able to see, are they able to pick up information in their periphery as well as their central vision? Are they able to accommodate? Um, are they safe? Um, looking at their actual mobility, are they able to move around their environment and be safe? Or if they put a pot on the stove and they walk away, are they, are they not attending to it anymore? Do they forget that they put it there? Um, and there can be other reasons they leave a pot on the stove, but potentially uh, a visual loss. Um, are they able to recognize objects and how they're supposed to be used? Again, I use the example of a comb. They might be able to name a comb, but they, do they know that it's for brushing their hair? Have some of those connections been lost? Um, and other ADLs and the IADLs. So you do an assessment of all of that, and then the so what, what can you do about it? There's sort of three levels, at least in adult rehab, of what you might do to try and remedy some of the visual loss. <clears throat> visual cognitive retraining often involves giving the people strategies to, um, or, or forcing them to start looking into those visual fields that they have lost. So for example, if this woman has lost her right visual field, she also probably has some weakness in her right side, so they're trying to have her use her left arm to cross midline and attend over in her right visual field. And over time, particularly with strategies, people can start compensating for the loss by scanning, by looking, turning their head to look across. So even if that vision doesn't return, the cognitive retraining can give them strategies so that they can regain function, regain independence, and maintain safety. We can also go in and make adaptations to the environment. And this would be something you might do for somebody that has poor visual acuity or poor contrast sensitivity or loss of depth perception, which is putting highlighted <coughs> strips on their stairs so they're able to better able be better able to see or identify when they're reaching the next step. You can do this across thresholds as well so that they have a warning that the, the terrain or the, the height of the terrain is about to change. And I think what's really exciting is how technology can be used to compensate for specific types of visual perceptual loss. Do you guys know what these are? Google Glass. So Google's put out, they, they put out prototypes of these. I don't think they're available on the market yet, but essentially there is a computer chip within the glasses, within that little <coughs> eyepiece here, that has a camera built in and a central, there's a central processor within that. So for example, if you had somebody with Alzheimer's disease wearing these glasses, the camera could pick up on the person's face that has just walked into their room and if they have forgotten what that person's name is, the Google Glass can essentially take that picture of the face, match it up with a Facebook account or a personal log of pictures, and whisper into that person's ear through the microphone that's back here, 
oh, that's Lars, he's a student in your class, you should ask him how his day was, or some type of information. So it could not only tell them who that person is, but could cue them on an appropriate topic of conversation. Yeah, right? So I think that there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to see as new types of compensation um, based on the technology as it becomes available. Okay, so that was mainly adult level de deficits. I'll talk a little bit about kids. We do spend a lot of time on this next semester. <coughs> Bless you, at least in terms of perceptual deficits in kids, but if we're talking about the visual system, it makes sense that we go talk a little bit about congenital blindness, so kids that are born with significant visual impairments or born blind. We are not necessarily, we are not going to be training them to use the sticks, I don't, I don't even know the name of it, this is not my area. Um, <laughs> we're not going to be teaching them to necessarily read Braille. There are specialized vision people who do that, uh, visual trainers. They will work with those kids on those aspects, but oftentimes OTs come in because there are a lot of other issues that happen or that can come up when children aren't born with sight. And so if you think about a baby being born not being able to see, that means hearing is their only distance sense available. And they have no control over that. With vision, you can choose to close your eyes. You can choose to stop that from coming in. But with hearing, they have no control over it. And without vision, they can't start connecting sounds to anything. So babies who hear their mother's voice can connect it to the face of their mother. Or that hear a car going by when they're outside can start making those connections. So early on, all they have is hearing, and hearing doesn't make a lot of sense especially distance hearing, because it's not something that they can lay their hands on. And vision also guides a lot of early development in terms of reaching. We talked about that. You know, first the baby looks at something, and then bam, we even have a reflex. That means our hand goes out to kind of go for it, to look for it. So all of that early hand-eye, hand-to-hand exploration doesn't happen in these kids. They aren't as motivated to explore. They can't see what's out there. Hearing is just not as motivating as vision. You know, vision, we have color, we have texture, we have movement. Hearing is just hearing. You don't necessarily want to reach towards a voice. Sometimes. So what we see in kids that are born blind or with very significant hearing loss is a delay in fine motor skills because they're not reaching, because they're not handling things, because they're not exploring. And we can also see delays in gross motor skills as well because their bodies aren't as motivated. So they, they will generally roll over at about the same time as other infants. But movement away, so um, being able to um, crawl, to be able to walk, to be able to stand, um, is often delayed in these kids. And some of that is a lack of exploration, and a lack of desire to go for that thing that they want. Some of it is also a fear of movement. You know, if you have to go through life not being able to see and visually monitor, it's very scary to move into an unknown type of space. And we can also see in these kids um, delays in attachment. So again, they're not seeing their parent's face. They're not returning a smile because they don't see a smile. They're not imitating or mirroring gestures or facial expressions like other kids do. So we can see deficits or, or again, delays in attachment and aspects of social communication. Language often isn't that interrupted. Um, sometimes they can actually produce sounds earlier than non-impaired children, but connecting those sounds to things, higher level language, sometimes can be. But for the most part, the problems are with social communication versus language. And how much of a, a lag we see depends on how much vision is left. If kids have some vision, they're going to be somewhat motivated to move, to use their hands. So if you, the more vision you have, <clears throat> the less delays we typically see. And generally, these kids are going to catch up ballpark of school age. Because by that time, we are seeing a higher level of integration of the remaining senses. So 
tactile, auditory, and prophobic. So as they overcome the fear movement, as they start moving through their world, as they start touching things and objects, they start having better representation of the world. They're able to start manipulating, they're able to move better, they're able to interact better. But until that integration happens, until they get out there and start exploring, <clears throat> it can be really challenging. And that's where OT can come in, especially before the first year. If they can encourage that early manipulation, encourage that early movement, encourage that early tactile handling of objects, then those delays can be reduced. And I wasn't going to put dyslexia in here, but I know my peanut gallery, somebody was going to ask it, so I figured it was better to just address it. Um, we think of this, and the reason I say somebody would ask it is because we think of dyslexia as, oh, those are the kids that see things backwards. So it must be a visual deficit, <coughs> right? But you'll notice in this diagram that has the most common areas associated with dyslexia, the occipital lobe is not in any way highlighted because dyslexia is not a primary problem of vision. What do you think it's a primary problem of? It is, it's a primary problem of phonological awareness, <clears throat> which has to do with how we hear and use sounds. And particularly that aspect of how we hear and use sounds related to language. Now it's kind of tricky because here the temporal gyrus isn't really lit up either, is it? And it's true that in kids with and without dyslexia, activity in the temporal lobe is about the same. The problem comes with the connection between the temporal lobe. What would sit right here? I know this is tough in this model, but any guesses? Wernicke's. Somebody said it, right? <laughs> All right, Wernicke's would be here. So that reception of language travels through the screen strip, which is your arcuate fasciculus. You guys don't have to know this. Honestly, I put it in here because I knew somebody was going to ask. And travels to the inferior frontal gyrus, <clears throat> probably around the area of Brokus, right? In here, it's marked in blue, oops, where's blue, as your inferior parietal area. What specific part of the inferior parietal area might this be? <laughs> the other one beside that. It's not, it's in the article it wasn't specific, but this is around the area of the supermarginal gyrus, which is an area for language processing. It's part of the inferior parietal area. Again, don't worry about it. But it's this mechanism here that connects the temporal lobe to the speech language processing areas, the integration areas of the parietal lobe, all the way to the frontal lobe. This is the circuit that is most impaired in kids with dyslexia. So it really is not a visual issue. It's a speech processing or language processing issue. The one place where vision does come in is this inferior part of the temporal lobe that we've already looked at a little bit today, which is the fusiform gyrus. And the specific area of that is related to word recognition. So that is another area that kind of comes up as different between kids with and without dyslexia. And the conundrum there is, is, is it chicken or the egg? Is it damage to this area that causes problems with word recognition? Or is it that these language areas are damaged, they're not recognizing words, and therefore activity in this part of the gyrus becomes minimal because it's not being used. So that, we don't know that. That's kind of where we're at. This is a 2015 article. That's the most updated that I could find. All right, but in general, take home message, dyslexia, not a visual disorder, not a disorder of the visual perceptual system. We do see visual perceptual deficits in kids, and this is where we'll live for a good part of next semester in your PEDS 2 class, because these kids have a lot of academic issues. They have a hard time copying from the board. They might have trouble keeping their eyes in a smooth plane when they're reading, so their eyes may jump a lot. Um, Handwriting-wise, their letters may be clumped together. They have a hard time knowing 
how much space leave between letters versus words versus sentences. So a lot of the spatial perceptual aspects of reading and writing can relate to academic difficulties, which is why kids may come to OT. We have to tease out is this a visual perceptual or visual motor issue? And we have tools to be able to do that. And again, that is really a next semester sort of thing. But this is a large population of kids that we see both in the school system and in outpatient occupational therapy. In terms of rehab for kids with visual perceptual deficits, you guys have seen this pyramid, I believe last semester you saw it in development. But really, we need to have good visual acuity and full visual fields before we're going to achieve higher level vision. So when kids come in with visual perceptual deficits, one of the first thing we ask is, have they had their eye, an eye test? You know, we don't typically test for visual acuity. Um, we may look at oculomotor control. We may do, can your eyes track you know, in this plane? Can they go vertical? Can they go diagonal? Are they teaming together? Can they accommodate? Can they converge? Can they diverge? We do look at that. Beyond that, we want to see are they able to maintain visual attention? Are they able to keep their eyes focused on something for a period of time? If they can't, then our intervention is going to start here with trying to draw their eyes, draw their attention to an aspect that we want them to pay attention to. So if they're not attending, it's going to be hard for them to scan, to recognize patterns, to remember things, to use their vision for cognition, um, and to achieve higher level skills. So this is sort of the process that we go through, and again, we'll talk about that more next semester, strategies for sort of tackling all of the different parts of this pyramid. But the problems that we'll see are here, and we have to figure out at what level the breakdown is. And that's where we'll focus our energy. Kind of clear difference between developmental approach and a adult rehab approach. In kids, we are trying to build those skills because we think we can make those connections. Most of the time in adults, we're trying to compensate for a loss or retrain to compensate, retrain to hopefully overcome that loss or to at least be able to compensate for that loss. I will go through optic nerve loss, if you guys want to hang out for three more minutes. Let's see if I can pull the 